So for my multimedia presentation, I have chosen to discuss my research on William Seward and his perspectives on the American Civil War. So William Seward was one of the most important politicians of the 19th century, and he made his residence in my hometown of Auburn, New York. Ever since I can remember, I've been fascinated with Seward. I believe it started when my mother took me to the Seward House Museum, which is just a few miles up the road from my house. So Seward was a New York Senator, Governor of New York, and Secretary of State under the Lincoln and Johnson administrations. He's most known for purchasing the state of Alaska in 1867, which is also known as Seward's Folly, but it turns out it panned out for him and for his role as the nation's foremost diplomat during the American Civil War. So, early life of William Seward. Although he lived in Auburn for most of adult, adult life, Seward was actually from Florida. That is, Seward lived on a farm in Florida, New York, where his father held enslaved people. Slavery wasn't outlawed in, in New York until 1827. His childhood experiences with enslavement made him detest the institution, and in his autobiography he wrote, I came to the conclusion that something was wrong with slavery, and that determined me to be an abolition. Seward also discussed how he much preferred the joys in the slave kitchens rather than the formalities of his father's parlor. I would definitely agree that spending time with fun people is better than spending time with a bunch of stuffy aristocrats. So how did Seward come to Auburn? So at the age of 15, Seward graduated Union College and graduated at the top of his class. After he graduated, he began to study law and passed the bar exam in 1823. I can't imagine going to college at 15. In January of 1824, Seward took a job as a junior law partner in the bustling town of Auburn, New York, under Judge Elijah Miller. Now, Elijah Miller was a huge man compared to Seward's five foot three stature, and he was quite intimidating, which, which makes it all the more interesting that Seward ended up proposing to his daughter after he established their law form. Now, after Seward proposed to Francis, um, Judge, Judge Elijah Miller said that he could marry Francis, but only if he lived in the same house in Auburn. Seward, of course, thinking that his father-in-law would die soon enough, took the offer and he moved in to the, the home on North Street. Now, he hadn't expected that his father-in-law would live for another 30 years. All right, so Seward's wife was a staunch feminist and abolitionist. So despite the claim in his autobiography, Seward was a moderate when it came to the emancipation of enslaved people. He supported the rights of black people and was morally opposed to slavery, but did not support, support the instant eman emancipation of all enslaved people. His wife, Frances, was a staunch abolitionist and kept pressing her husband to quit Lincoln's cabinet if they did not end slavery all at once. Therefore, Seward often found himself being accused of being both a radical by the conservatives and not radical enough by the abolitionists. Seward and politics. In 1831, Seward began his political career where he was elected to the New York State Senate. At the age of 37, Seward obtained a two-term governorship of New York. By the election of 1860, Seward thought that he had enough prestige that he was going to be the Republican nominee for, the, for president to the point where he even threw a party in for himself in his backyard at Auburn. Although that didn't work out so well for him. 
It was soon after this party that he learned that he'd been beaten by a backwood single-term senator from Illinois' Abraham Lincoln. He just couldn't possibly understand how this this simple man who had who wasn't as cultured as Seward could have won the Republican nomination. Okay, so this is the straw that broke the camel's back. So, despite their initial rivalry, Seward and Lincoln quickly became allies. That means that Seward had to swallow his pride and be like, okay, how can I serve my country? So, Seward accepted his role as the man behind the curtain and began to campaign in earnest for Lincoln and was asked to become Secretary of State if Lincoln won. Of course, Lincoln did win. After decades of political controversy, the election of Lincoln, a man who controversially opposed the expansion of slavery, caused seven states to secede from the Union to form a confederacy, thus plunging the nation into civil war. Okay, so Seward's perspectives on the Civil War. So for my research project this semester, I have been reading letters written from Seward to his family, friends, and other politicians about his perspectives on the Civil War. So given the secession and outbreak of war, Seward was forced to spend most of his time in Washington, D.C. Throughout the Civil War, Seward wrote letters to his family in Auburn about how he was feeling and his perspectives on events that had happened. So Seward's daughter, Fanny, was his favorite, so he did write her a lot of letters. So on one letter in, dated from May 21st, 1862, he wrote how he witnessed the horrors of war and saw how men were suffering. He also reiterated how he believed in the moral dogmas of the Union cause, that he genuinely believed that the Union would win despite their initial losses. So just some historical background. At the beginning of the American Civil War, the Union lost more battles than they won. And it wasn't until about like 1862 when the war started to change. So on June 4th, 1862, um, Seward wrote Fanny a letter where he discusses how the anxiety that he was feeling after the losses at Richmond and how the entire cabinet felt since they were close to the battle sites. So Seward also wrote letters to his wife, Frances Seward, frequently. On September 27th, 1862, Seward discussed how about how their son, Will Seward Jr. was stationed at Bunker Hill with his troops. The letter showed how the Civil War affected his own family. The following year in June, Seward wrote about how the Democrats were trying to take advantage of the American people's wariness with the war to recover favor at the cost of the moral stake between the Union and Confederacy. The letter showed how Seward had unwavering commitment to keep the Union together, the, emanci the emancipation of enslaved peoples, and his commitment to the Union cause. So throughout my research, I came to a couple of conclusions. So Seward's letters from the Civil War present a principled commitment to his cause, despite his emotions surrounding battles, how the war affected his own family and various political events. So despite the fact that he was scared, he just kept doing whatever he could to help the Union. They also showed that Seward was not just a clever politician and renowned statesman, but he, but rather a family man who did his best to balance both his work life and duties as a husband and father in Auburn.